All right. So uh, we are working our way to the essential truths. And uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the Trinity. So easy to understand. Simple to be able to fully comprehend completely. <laughs> and uh, so got a question for you up front as we get started. How would you explain to a four-year-old the Trinity? Because we're going to get there at the end. How would you tell a four-year-old about the Trinity? Any idea? Not ice, water, and steam. <laughs> True that. <laughs> What's that? A coin. A coin? Haven't heard that one. The head and the, and the back and the head. Oh, okay. Obviously, like a three leaf clover. Yeah. 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 Three persons, and we'll never understand it, but we can embrace it and love it. Did you say we would never understand it this side of heaven? What about the other side? Well, when we get there, we'll find it. Well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Will we under, fully understand it there, or maybe even not even then? I think the finite mind is not going to be able to fully understand it. It's just a reality. Um, I think that's that's true. I think we'll have a better understanding of it with a clear, non-polluted by sin mind, but fully understand it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Better appreciate it? Yes, absolutely. Which is what we want to do even on this side is better appreciate it. And we'll get there too. So I am going to work through at the end some practical implications and maybe you'll think of more, but I've got at least four that I want to walk through. Why it's why it's it's healthy in the Christian life, and one of them has to do with kids. So we'll get there. So entrusted with the confession of the Trinity, regardless of how well we can understand it, the church has been entrusted with confession that this is true about God. Um, so that's where we're going. And uh, so I showed you when we did this, when you did a quick overview of the essential truths a couple weeks ago, I kind of showed you a few things about them. We're going to take each piece that we walk through then for the Trinity. We're going to walk through it. So this first thing we believe, confess, and worship. The one true God, one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so the the goal is that the church faithfully stewards this confession. One God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And I want to walk through three, three means of stewarding this confession. I want to start with biblical revelation. We read the scriptures and we see it in the scriptures and we want to try and understand what does God disclose in Scripture and how is that disclosure rightly interpreted? Because it's not just that we read it, but there are those who have interpreted it and come up with false confessions about God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. So how is that disclosure rightly interpreted? That's important to understand. Second, faithful and careful expression. How has this truth, as it's been interpreted and encountered false teachings, plus tried to help congregations understand it, how has it been guarded and taught? So we're going to walk through that. And we'll even walk through these not-so-good examples that, that we... Uh, mentioned at the beginning. 
Third is practical implications. Why is this truth important and how do we apply it? So pretty simple outline. What's the Bible say? Um, what, what are our faithful expressions and why have we crafted those? People reading the Bible in the church and coming to those conclusions. Yeah. Uh-huh. Where do you fall as far as young earth versus a, you know, <laughs> repurposed Kansas, let's say, you know, there's, I thought there's some debate there. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't love the dinosaurs, too. He loves that. Well, I know they have the answers in Genesis, people, I know they're kind of responsive to me, but I'm just curious, what's your thoughts? Yeah. Well, I still hold to, just because of how the language is used, in Genesis, I still hold to a young earth. I think that everything in, in science can be reconciled to that. Absolutely do. However, um, I, I don't dismiss the work that's been done to look at whether or not it could be a longer period. The days in Genesis, like curtains over things that were being, are being done, I've heard it described that way. So... Um, I have the, um, I agree to disagree, yeah. but not, not a fully dismiss, but my personal conviction yeah, I, I, from the study. Yeah. I have family that are Christian, but they're in the scientific field, like high academic kind of stuff. And so yeah. they, they kind of try to back into even some evolutionary kind of stuff where God used evolution. Yeah. They're called evolutionary theorists. Yeah. Uh, evolutionary theists. Yeah. Yeah. Theistic evolutionists. Yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah. I look at it a little differently because that term is. Um, yeah. Um, but I'll tell you what. So next time, um, um, I want to describe a theological method where you take into account science and philosophy. Um, into your theological method? Kind of talk about that. I think in the end, science will eventually, like, it, it will never, never fully catch up. Yeah. But, like, where science is off now, it will eventually, the two, there is, because there is a creator. Right. And he created all yeah. of the science in the world. You know, science is the wrong term, but yeah. the way things work. Right. There's a gap right now between uh, the way we understand that things work and how they were actually created and eventually Yeah, made. I mean, the creator trumps everything, right? right? Um, every, every scientific hypothesis. Well, isn't there like um, a, essentially like a twisting of or a moving of dating to discredit biblical historical events? Yeah, and, and that's... Well, it's all modeling. Yeah. Purpose, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. You have to make assumptions when you make modeling. And, yeah, so... Let's save a little bit, a bit of this for next time, because I want to walk through that method. And as we walk through that method, um, it'll help us, I hope, think through how to interact with um, with things that are things that develop in in science, in philosophy. Um, yeah, and a lot of the problems, yeah. the, the actual studies and the actual facts that they can look at. This is this is what's happening. This is what has happened. They choose to interpret it in light of their own yeah. thinking about evolution. Whereas if you look at it from a different perspective, you can get a totally different answer to the same yeah. set of facts, set of so to speak. And, and that's one of the things that they've done, like with, uh, it's taken billions of years for our constant, const, continents, I can't talk with these fake teeth I got. <laughs> Sorry. It took you know billions of years for our continents to get where they are, they gradually separate. But there's a lot of evidence that shows that that is not necessarily the case, that those continents were all at one time, which the scientists agree with. Yeah. They call it Pansy or whatever. But it, there is a lot of evidence out there to suggest that it broke up very rapidly and moved to where it is today. And by rapidly, I don't mean overnight, I mean a, a much faster period of time. And they, they totally ignore that kind of stuff. They choose, it's, we won't get there. Yeah. It's, like, it's like global warming, they choose what they want. Yeah. 
I really believe mankind has caused some global warming, but it's not the carbon dioxide. It's all the concrete we put up everywhere, but that's just me. Wow, we're really going off, uh, right. off, off, the, off the trail. Yeah. <laughs> well, greenhouse gases. They're making everything greener. What's the problem? Let me say, let me say one thing since we are since we are stepping into talking about scripture. So um, in scripture, there's a uh, God has established a um, an order to things, and one of the orders in scripture is so the so the seven days, six day plus God rested. That was an established pattern that He uses um, in human life, but particularly in His setting for His people for worship because you have the seventh day being a sabbath then you have the seventh day being the day to some level they're all acting at the same time yep yep and uh so you mentioned earlier about what will be like when you know when uh, on the other side so still um still no um no scripture that indicates that he will no longer be the incarnate son so there you'll be seeing Jesus and remembering, oh, wait a minute. He's also fully God with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And you'll still be marveling at that, I think, that, that reality. And I think that that has to be a case, too, because uh, way back whenever Moses was on the mountain and everything, and God said, you can't look at him or he'd be totally destroyed. Yeah. And I have a feeling whenever God says totally destroyed, he means you ain't going to hell, you're God. You cease to exist. So even in heaven, I don't think that is, even with perfect bodies, we can look upon God the Father in his majesty and his glory. So we see Jesus. Yeah. That we can look upon. We shall see or not. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to get there. Okay. Yeah, we're going to get there in a minute. Good. <laughs> yeah. God the Son, uh, in the beginning was the Word. I've, I've said this one many times. Um, I love John's Gospel. I love John chapter 1. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, and then you have Jesus, the incarnate God, the Son, incarnate Son of God, um, appears about 40 times in John's Gospel. The incarnate Son of God the Father. The incarnate God the Son of God the Father. You see that over and over again. Now, some of those passages overlap, the ones that I mentioned earlier, the 100 and the 40. But again and again and again, you see, uh, you see Christ talking about His Father. Um, you see that mentioned. You see Him praying to His Father. Um, John 17, uh, Ma uh, so you see it, you see over and over again these passages that that uh, he claims he does not sidestep he directly claims that he is the son to the father and to say anything different about him you'd have to also say oh okay we got to go edit these verses because it can't be that well, you've got to have a I've completely different say, interpretation I've heard right people say that Jesus never never actually told them that he was God. Bible, you're not reading the whole thing. <laughs> what? Come on. But, but, I mean, it was sad. But anyway, yeah. I'm running across folks who just believe things without actually reading them mm -hmm. themselves. Well, we're going to talk about that in the, in the practical implications. So, God the Holy Spirit, 16 times in John's Gospel, he's mentioned directly, 50 plus times in Acts. So, that's what that's kind of what you expect, because because Jesus is going to point to the coming of the Holy Spirit to his disciples. He's going to talk about it um, from from the very beginning. Um, he meets with Nicodemus and etc. He's going to talk about the Holy Spirit, and then he's going to explain the Holy Spirit to the to the disciples, John fourteen through seventeen, and then Acts he comes, and boom! Would not you expect that because Christ has ascended? So the Son has gone to be at the Father's side, still incarnate. And now, as He promised, the Holy Spirit, boom, the Holy Spirit comes, Acts chapter 2, and over and over and over again in the book of Acts. There's barely a chapter in the book of Acts 
that doesn't mention the Holy Spirit and the work that he's doing. And you go, okay, now that Holy Spirit that was there at, at the beginning of creation was there when God provided an individual, a craftsman to have wisdom and be able to do the work that he'd been set to do when he is there in the presence of David's life, when he's promised in Ezekiel, they come and give us the fresh. Now he's here. And there's no questioning it when you go through the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit present in the church, in believers' lives and in the church. Uh, when the Helper comes, who I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. And Jesus, um, a number of times, explains specifically and generally what the Spirit is coming for, why he's coming. And then you see through Acts, Okay, that's what he meant. Okay, that's what he meant. Okay, that's what he meant. Um, so, training in the New Testament. You, <laughs> we are so thankful that we live in this time where we can read the New Testament and we can understand God's unfolding plan to reveal himself, Father, Son, and Spirit, um, and then go back and read the Old Testament. And we observe you know, the Sabbath move to, uh, to Sunday, um, yeah, Jesus' resurrection, right? So there's an order in Scripture. You think you've also got to put into there, which science won't naturally do. You've got to put in there the order of how God establishes things um, for his people. So that's part of the reason why I'm inclined to honor um, linguistically the, lang the Hebrew language plus the order of events in, in creation in Genesis 1 and 2 based on that. Um, so anyway, next week, Theological Method, we'll step through that so I can talk about how you, how you put those things in context of when, you're, when you're doing uh, theological study from Scripture, which I think will help a bit, not only in that question, but others as well. So, Okay, wow. Already thinking, will I get through this lesson? But keep asking questions. It's, it's absolutely, absolutely fair in this class to ask questions. All right, let's look at the Old Testament. So we're going to look at God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And just so you know, after this lesson, that's going to be the structure of the rest of our time. We're going to, we're going to um, talk about God the Father in more detail. So I'm just going to, I'm going to skim through some of this tonight, the verses, because we're going to step into each of the persons. And related to God the Father, related to God the Son, related to God the Spirit. That's where we'll hit salvation, we'll hit the church. Um, as we go through, the other essentials will be crafted in this. And I'll show you in a minute why I'm doing it that way when we hit the confessions. So, so God the Father, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created. Um, then you see also, you know, you'll see in a second, the Holy Spirit. Then in John 1, you see, oh, the Word. So God created, in Genesis 1, speaks to God the Father, knowing that the others were active in creation um, under the plan of God the Father. Then God said, let us make man in our own image. Some have interpreted that as a, as a um, plural of majesty. But from a Trinitarian perspective, you look back and you say, let us make man in our own image. Well, the incarnate Christ, so John 1, you read John 1, and you see the incarnate Christ, he, as man, is in the image of God. He's reflecting God. John says, um, no one has seen God any time. Uh, God, the Son incarnate, he has revealed him. He tells Philip and John, because um, Philip asks, show us the Father. He says, have you not seen me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So in our image, when he says the us, that implies that he's talking to the Son, the Spirit. Um, but there's, you know, there's been other theories about that. But it's a pointer to this is God the Father speaking. Exodus 3.14, so I've given you this scripture in the notes. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. 
And he said, this is what you should say to the sons of Israel. I am has sent me to you. In the New Testament, Jesus uses I am to speak of himself. That he's eternally existed. And then he's accused by the Jews of only God can say that. So there is a I am that Jesus uses, the incarnate son, which points back to Exodus 3 as being God the Father speaking. God the Son not actively speaking in the Old Testament. This is God the Father speaking, but Jesus, God the Son, can say the same thing about himself. Just as if the Holy Spirit spoke, he could say the I am because the Godhead is eternal. So God the Father, I am who I am. And then Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Which word for God is that? Do you know? Is that Yahweh? That is that Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Or which one? Um, God is... Yahweh, mm -hmm. I am is, uh, I'll get back to you on that one. Okay. Sure. My mind just blanked with that one. Um, yeah. God the Son, you see prophecy of God the Son happening in Scripture, in the prophets and in Psalms. So that's where the prophecies pick up. That's the parsing too far, um, but uh, confess that's true. Salvation, the eternal plan of God the Father. Uh, Jesus' prayer in John 17, beginning of his prayer in John 17, describes that. Um, describes how he has glorified the Father by accomplishing everything the Father sent him to do. So, and he talks about briefly about salvation, specifically of those that he's with. Um, mediated by the Son, 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6, um, so which walks through the Son's, uh, what the Son accomplished for our sin. Uh, conveyed with conviction by the Spirit, John 16, one of the passages in John that talks about the Spirit, that the Spirit will convict of truth and righteousness and judgment. Um, and so every time the gospel is proclaimed, there's that um, possibility the Spirit will convict that person of the truth of the gospel, of righteousness and, oh, I'm a sinner, um, and conviction will be brought. So wonderful when we share the gospel with somebody, wonderful when it gets preached, but without the presence of the Holy Spirit, um, working in that person to convict them, convict them of the truth of it. Um, it might be a nice discussion and a good argument or whatever, but that's, that's what he was sent, part of what he was sent to do, a promise that he would do. Uh, so there you have two of the things we've talked about um, where God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit actively engaged in the historical unfolding of um, God's word uh, about uh, uh, the plan for our redemption, for salvation in there. We could talk about this for a long time, but just want to give you a couple examples just to be thinking about, um, about the Father, Son, and Spirit. Okay. I want to go through our attempt at times, especially in, in, the, in the recent times, to try and explain the Trinity. Um, so through recent history, the church has attempted to confess and teach through comparison to creation. Picking things in creation say, okay, I want something that will help, help it make sense um, to my, my mind, or if I'm telling somebody about it. So items, the egg, the shell, the yolk, the white, Apple, peel, fruit, core, water, um, ice, liquid, vapor. They're all consistent molecularly, and they serve a different purpose, where the other ones aren't at all the same attributes. 
Yeah. Leslie mentioned the coin. Right. Yep. There is nothing in creation that you can use that will give a, a um, good analogy to the Trinity. I'm even going to say that, a good analogy. Um, because, anyway, we'll get there in a second. So the items, so there's some. People try to use, well, there's a triple point of water. Yes, but you still have parts. <laughs> Relationships. So I've heard this one before, that a person can be a grandfather, a father, and a son all at the same time. You know, I, I'm I'm not only a I'm not only a son, but I'm a father. I'm not only a father and a son, but I'm a grandfather. Um, what do you think is wrong or flawed with these attempts? We're in some ways limiting, right? Like yeah. Yeah, and they do tie into, actually tie into false teachings as well. So I would just say, you know, stop. <laughs> um, Did I miss some of the notes? Some of the notes? <laughs> I see where you are now. If you did, I'll catch you up. That's on the Trinity, I messed up somewhere. Oh. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we haven't. We, I flipped it around. I think oh, okay. I flipped the order. I think. Okay. So we're on feeble attempts. Yeah, we're on feeble attempts. Write down all the yeah. <laughs> There's a reason I put this one ahead. I was thinking about it today, and then I thought um, I wanted to get to like a gentle point for. Um, so good-hearted attempt, but problems. Um, the, with the first, God is one in three persons, not parts. You can't take the yardstick and say, God the Father is, you know, one foot, God the Son, second foot, God the... So the problem with the item, the, those Old Testament saints would have just wished they had the eyes that we do for the, for, for the scriptures to know God this way. So the work from there is uh, expression. And here's, a, here's something I presented a couple weeks ago, though not consciously conceived at the moment of salvation... So a new Christian, a brand new believer, to try and quiz them on the Trinity, uh, that'd be kind of difficult. But this truth of who God reveals them to be is foundational to everything the church believes and confesses. Every truth that we hold to, um, the foundation of it is the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Right, eternally the plan of God and all the activity that we've seen through history, God bringing his plan about, foundational to everything. Uh, so let's look at real quickly at foundational, foundational to a couple of these essential truths that we talked about. So the, the distinction and the operations of each person. So Father, Son, and Spirit are different in what they do not in their essential nature, because they're each fully God, but in what they do, um, so present, even if not expressly disclosed. Because in Scripture, we read where there's express or disclosure of the Father, of the Son, of the Spirit, but things they are actively doing in history that we don't see, that we don't know about. The Bible is authoritative and sufficient. God has not revealed everything that he's accomplishing in history. Their um, doings are different, but their attributes, attributes are consistent. Absolutely. Okay. Yep, absolutely. That's the, because the son is not the father, the father is not. Because the father didn't die on the cross. Yep. Say that again. How did you say that? That their doings are different, but their attributes are consistent. Mm -hmm. Because they're all Every, every attribute you can say about God is true of the Father, Son, the Spirit. Yeah. Present, all that, but mm -hmm. yeah. The way that they do their action verbs are different. Yeah. So let's think about the scriptures for a minute. 
It's the eternal word, uh, eternal word of God the Father, because he's the Father, so all things come from him. Uh, affirmed by the Son, and I've given you a couple verses to look at. Psalms 119.89 speaks directly about um, his word. Affirmed by the Son, so I gave an example, Matthew 4.4, 4, where Satan is challenging him, and he cites an Old Testament passage given uh, through Moses by the Father. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So over and over again, Jesus points to Scripture, explains God's Word, um, speaks God's Word, right? Um, but uh, if you question whether or not the Bible is true, um, the Bible is, the Bible is uh, unchanging. If you question any of those things, just note how often the Son affirms things in Scripture, says things that are consistent with the true interpretation of Scripture. If we only had His mind, <laughs> so it would be so, easier, so much easier to interpret difficult Scriptures um, and know how to apply them uh, appropriately. When Jesus says, you know, man lives by, you know, the word of God, but he is the word of God. He is. So it's kind of like, yes, he's pointing to the Old Testament and the, and the scripture, but he's pointing to himself too. Like, yeah, the father, there is some father implications, but he's also saying like, yeah, I, I am self-sufficient in some ways. Yeah. Probably I am self-sufficient in my Trinitarianism, but yeah. Yeah. So part of the, Oh gosh, hold, let me hold off on that because we're going to do a whole, whole, whole uh, lesson on on the incarnate Son of God, and we'll we'll get into some of these things. I'm tempted to to okay. go down that road, but yeah, but we'll we'll get there, we'll get there. And inspired by the Spirit, so Second Timothy three sixteen, Second Peter one twenty twenty one talks about how no prophecy is of man, but from the Spirit of God. Um, so scriptures, um, the action of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit present um, in uh, scriptures, distinct operations. Um, I don't want to... Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and she will name him Emmanuel. Well, that's reflected in the birth in the Old Testament. That's reflected in his naming. Um, Isaiah 9, 6, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. And then it goes on to describe that son. Um, and that's another powerful prophecy. And the interesting thing about these, these prophecies in, in Isaiah, plus others, is especially with the child is born, um, born of a virgin, um, there was an expectation that, that was going to be a fairly immediate event when it's spoken by the prophet. Um, and when you read the prophecies, a lot of the prophecies point to um, a event that's coming in near time, but a further event, which is, which is the real expectation of what God's going to accomplish in his son uh, in the day of the Lord, uh, in the kingdom is near passages. Daniel 7, 13 through 14, I kept looking at, in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, honor, and a kingdom. All these things describing Christ, the incarnate son of God. And to him... Um, so that all the peoples, nations, and populations of all languages might serve him. Painting a picture of what's going to happen when Christ returns, right? His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Now here's a passage that, to go back to Karen's question earlier, here's a passage that if you were carefully studying the prophecy, uh, this one in Daniel particularly, this everlasting kingdom, this unending kingdom, you would have thought one or two things. You would have thought, 
Well, perhaps he is he he is the, the the son of God. He is God incarnate. Or perhaps you would have said, well, that's just like what was described for David. That David would have an everlasting kingdom through through the coming of all of his lineage. Um, but when Christ arrives, and when you realize who he is, as John did, as other did, others did, that he's God the Son in human flesh. When he does things to point to that, when he says that about himself, and some say blasphemy, those who are listening can go, oh, that's what that prophecy meant. That's what that prophecy meant. It pointed, pointed to him. And then God the Holy Spirit. A lot of, a lot of passages about the Holy Spirit. So um, Genesis 1, 2. So you've got... You've got uh, um, God creating, and the earth was formless and a desolate emptiness, darkness over the s- surface of the deep, Spirit of God hovering over the surface of the waters. So there's God the Holy Spirit in creation. So we have God the Father speak. We have through Christ creation, we have the Holy Spirit present as well in the time of creation. Exodus 31.3 and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in knowledge, in all kinds of craftsmanship. That is, as the Lord is establishing those who are going to build his temple, build his tabernacle. And there he says, Spirit of God is giving this individual these things. So there's instances in the Old Testament where the Spirit of God is actively present in someone, not permanently, not indwelling permanently, but present to help accomplish God's plan, God's will um, in different ways. Psalm 51, so this is David's confessing his sin. Create me a clean heart, God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not take, oh, take me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. So David is is indicating his reliance on the Holy Spirit to help him in being a rightful king and realizing that his sin, his extreme sin, could separate him from from that which he, he relies upon to be able to be an effective king. That's an interesting one because it's... Um, it's one of the early times in history that a specific recognition of the Holy Spirit um, is given not by God, but by a human being, right? Ezekiel 36, there's several passages in Ezekiel that are fascinating to look at. I've given you some references, 11, 24, 37, 39, 29, where we're... Um, uh, we're the pro- a prophecy, but the Holy Spirit is made. But here's the one uh, that uh, that fits in with what happens when he comes, when he indwells believers in the New Testament. I will put my spirit within you, bring it about that you walk in my statutes and are careful and follow my ordinances. So that was the intention because Israel was rebellious. They're, they're uh, in exile, um, but God's making a promise to his people that I understand your inability to obey, but the Spirit will come in you to help you obey. It'll take this heart of stone, turn it into a heart of flesh. Um, and so uh, putting that in a, in a, uh, um, a sanctification perspective in the New Testament, as Paul does in Romans, for example, um, to see, well, this is what the Spirit was intended to to do in believers, but not yet, not until Christ comes, not until Christ ascends, right? And then I put in Acts 2, so this is a fascinating one. This is in the middle of of, uh, Peter's sermon at Pentecost. He's he's preaching and the 3,000 will come We'll come to uh, to faith, um, and he uses a passage from Joel two 
28 through 32. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams, and even on my male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. So this is a passage Peter's using to explain what happened to them. The Holy Spirit came down on them. They're, they're speaking, and they're speaking in other languages, the languages of all the people that are there, that they can hear the, in the, they can hear what's being said in their own language, right? The one they're familiar with. And Peter begins to preach, and he declares this, because they say, you guys are drunk. No, here's what happened. This is a fulfillment or a partial fulfillment of the prophecy made by Joel. So Joel's prophecy, what would it have meant back then? Now Peter knows. And we're going to see in a minute how this is the beginning of a lot of activity in the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts that reveals who he truly is. All right, let's jump into the New Testament. God the Father. Okay, so in the Old Testament, that clarity between Father, Son, Spirit, not quite there, and that description of the Father to the Son, not quite there. But I mentioned how it explodes. Gospel of John, over a hundred passages in the Gospel of John consistently identifying God the Father. I actually pulled all those a couple days ago just to look through them and look at that. And it's amazing. Um, you might not notice that if you just read through John, but all these times where God the Father is identified as Father to the Son. So you would think, um, I, I've said a few times how how amazed John must have been when he realized um, who Christ was, the incarnate Son of God. And the time spent in that book of writing those things to, to completely clarify that you go without question, um, he is the Son to the Father, God the Son to God the Father. So it consistently identifies God the Father. begins with John 1.1, which draws on Genesis 1. So in the beginning, God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God, starting there. And John just rolls from there, unfolding who God the Father is, unfolding who God the Son is, Jesus, unfolding who God the Holy Spirit is. His gospel just is incredibly full of those things so the reader can understand. Not only in John 20, 30, 31, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, or know that he is, and believe and have life in his name, but also that you may know who God is, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Yeah. Nothing was created that has been created that wasn't created through the sun. Right. And you look at Genesis, it's like God created the heavens and the earth. And it's like, you know, it's the same person. Right. Mm -hmm. It's the same person. Yeah. And then practically, how do we actually apply this truth um, in our lives and in our church and in our families? So that's where we're going. Uh, so let's start with. God progressively revealed this eternal truth of his eter eternal being throughout Scripture and history. And you get sneak peeks of it in the Old Testament, but you get this explosion in the New, New Testament from the incarnation of the Son and then going forward. Uh, so we want to walk through those kind of some Scriptures. We're going to look first at Old Testament, the New Testament. We're only going to look at a few passages. There's, there's a ton of them. And I've given you some of those in the notes. Um, but let's step back to what we talked about with scriptures last week, the idea of this grand narrative, that the Bible is a Trinitarian creation and redemption narrative. It's Trinitarian because God is the author of creation, God the author of redemption, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And we see that at the very beginning, as we'll see in a minute. And uh, there's a real 
historical timeline of the grand narrative. There is God the Father working throughout the scriptures, present in history, um, accomplishing his grand plan. There is God the Holy Spirit present throughout history. There is God the Son present throughout history. Augustine will tell you, um, so he's uh, late 4th century, early 5th century uh, saint, so St. Augustine. Augustine will tell you, because he's thought carefully, he worked carefully on, on both the Trinity and on how to read Scripture to understand the incarnation of the Son. And he will tell you, as others have, that God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, always present and active throughout the entire history of creation. Um, so anytime you read about something about what the Son says or does, or what God the Father says and does, the whole Trinity, one God, three persons, whole Trinity present and perhaps in some way active in all the events of history. Um, so the question, though, in, in discerning it from the scriptures, where, when, and how is the revelation of God as Trinity in this narrative? You can find glimpses in the Old Testament, but not full disclosure of the revelation of the persons and their relationship to one another. We have the beauty of, because we're in the time after the New Testament, after the Son was fully revealed, the Spirit fully revealed, we have the time to be able to go back in, in the Old Testament and read it and say, oh, okay, now I can find some pointers. But think if you were an Old Testament saint and you heard about the Spirit, uh, you heard about the prophecies of the Messiah, but it didn't come to your mind or knowledge to say, well, that Messiah, God the Son, same God as God the Father. You wouldn't have put that together. Who did they think that Messiah, they just thought the Messiah was going to be a man, a special man? It was a surprise when Jesus um, declared through his acts and his works um, his, and his words that he was God. Surprise and for some, blasphemy. Right, but it was yeah. they were expecting a man? They were not expecting God in the flesh. Even though you could look back and read the prophecies and go, oh, yes, that's what it meant. They were expecting um, that there would be a human... He'd be Messiah. He'd be King. Okay, but it was they were expecting a human, a man. Right. Okay. Well, I think they probably expected an immediate lordship as well. Hmm. An immediate. An immediate lordship. That there was, he was already gonna be. Yeah. All in one, not. Yeah. Leading up to showing. Yeah. There's a couple of passages we're gonna look at them that even convince people after Christ came, after he ascended, that interpreted those passages in a way that they said, he can't be God. Um, and the Spirit can't be God. So even then, there's that's what that looks like. You're taking parts of one thing to compare that each, each person is fully God, not part of God. So Father, Son, Spirit, fully God. That's right. Yeah. Um, the second, relationships, God is three distinct persons, not one appearing as three. So the heresy called modalism, and we'll see that in a minute. Modalism, M-O-D-A-L-I-S-M. Um, so yeah, it's... Um, I mean, the Father, the Son. See, this is why it's this is why it's um, beyond our understanding, because 
we can head one way or the other, both are wrong. There's nothing in creation. So our, our minds can, can try and understand it, we can confess it, but because we have nothing we can compare it to, compare God to, nothing we can compare um, the Godhead to, we just kind of have to give up. And if we say he's like, that's how people will start to think. Um, they'll start to work that in. At uh, our old church, when we first got there, there was a book in the library that had the apple. In the church library. Okay, we gotta, we have to take that out. <laughs> we, what's that? We made that one disappear. Yeah, we, we don't want kids reading that and getting false conceptions about who God is. Um, Hmm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The oneness God. So in, in yeah, in some Pentecostalism, yeah, they oneness Pentecostalism holds to modalism. Um and I was talking to somebody the other day who had heard that somewhere, you know, said something, and I said, well, no, it's not quite. Um so let's look at major false teachings that have happened in, in history. Um, because the writings of the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, evidences that creation is flawed and evil. So this is this is not this is not what I'm saying. This is what the the uh, uh, this particular heresy says. It says if you read the Old Testament, you see that it's flawed and evil. Oh, and the New Testament looks different. So the uh, this heresy says that the God who created is flawed. It could not have been a, a, true, a true, true perfect God that made creation. Because look at creation. Um, there's imperfection in that creator. So that's Gnosticism. Gnosticism thought, well, there is a pure spiritual...